There was this land far, far away in the bottom of the South Pacific. This was an enchanted land, an amazing land, an unknown land. There was no people in this land. This was a land of tropical birds, beautiful colored parrots, a land of rivers and streams and waterfalls and pristine beaches. This was a land of forests. 85% of New Zealand was covered in forests. And the king of that forest was a kauri tree. And the kauri was rooted to the ground and touching the sky and held it up the sky. They held up the beautiful long white cloud of Aotearoa. Imagine, if you will, a waka or a war canoe, 40 meters long, carved out of a single kauri tree, powered by 60 Māori warriors with full facial moko, and it was paddling straight towards you. It's 1791, and you're a young British sailor seeing New Zealand for the first time. It's a fairly daunting experience. But this is the mana of the kauri tree. It's the respect and the dignity of this tree. Now, the kauri tree is over 160 million years old. It's one of the oldest, largest, and most valuable trees in the world. The greatest and biggest kauri tree that ever lived was called the Great Ghost. Sadly, he was burnt in the 1800s. But the Great Ghost was over 26 meters in girth. That's 85 feet. And he was over 56 meters in height to the crown, which is over 200 feet. Now, if you took 13 strong men with their arms linked, they could have almost got around him. That's pretty impressive. That was what New Zealand was covered with, these amazing kauri trees. 85% of our country was covered with timber, and a great deal of that was kauri. Now, to stand in one of those groves of kauri and look up at those crowns up in the sky is an amazing and humbling experience. You get there with whatever attitude you come with, and you leave there without it. They're empowering, and they're humbling. They sort of look like great sort of Gothic cathedrals sticking up in the sky. And that's the mana of the kauri tree. Half of New Zealand's, half of the world's, excuse me, forests are now gone. That's a sad thing to think about. There are seven billion, little over seven billion people on Earth. Without trees, the world would be a desolate, desolate place. If you close your eyes for a moment and just imagine a world without trees, what you'll see is seven billion people who can't breathe. Because without trees, the air is unbreathable and we're gone. When the first humans arrived in New Zealand about 800 years ago. It's not a very long time for the world. And they arrived to the world I described earlier, a pristine, incredible country, a country full of hope. This country was something you could only dream about, really. There's no travel magazine now that can show you that country. There isn't one left on Earth, sadly. Now, the first Europeans arrived in New Zealand about 500 years later. And from the 1800s to the 1950s, and sadly, further on, we assaulted the kauri tree. In 1906 alone, we cut 443,000 cubic meters of kauri and processed it. That's 16 million cubic feet. I'd give you an indication of what 443,000 cubic meters is. A large timber house takes about 50 cubic meters of wood for the complete house. And we had 443,000 cubic meters. If you took, a, say, a 4x2, you know, standard building product, 4x2, that would go four and a bit times around the world. That's what we cut in one year. And bear in mind that a great deal of our kauri in New Zealand went to Australia or to Britain. Because the ships of the line for the Royal British Navy, the best mast you could get, and of course, your ships at that day, that was your nuclear force, that was the power of your country. They were built of kauri. And to get that kauri, you had to sail around the world. And when you got to New Zealand, that was just the beginning. You had to somehow make a deal with the local iwi. What was in it for them? And then you'd go deep into the bush, you'd find the tree with an ax and a saw. You'd take that tree down. Then you'd buck it up into these giant things. You'd scarf it and then have to get it out of the bush. You'd drag it out of the bush. If you were lucky, you had teams of bullock, 20, 30 bullocks, dragging these trees out of the bush. But even then, it was back-breaking labor. But that was the value that Kauri had. That's what they believed. This was the finest timber in the world. Because as a timber, Kauri is amazing. It's got a clean, straight, beautiful grain. 
There's no taper in the tree. They just go up like kind of iron pillars. So for a sawmiller, it's a dream. There's thin bark. There's no knots. The branches fall off at about 40 years, so there's no pruning required. This is where these ready-made wood stores in the forest. Now, 96% of the kauri forest in New Zealand is gone. There's 4% left. The further you go south, the less kauri there seems to be in the mind of a New Zealander. When you go north, you realize that kauri is alive. It's well, there's hope. But what is that hope? We don't know. What can we do with kauri? A few years ago, I was asked to speak at a conference in California. And I spoke about kauri, and I spoke about New Zealand. And at the end of my presentation, I performed a piece on a kauri guitar. I then sold that kauri guitar right after the conference for 22,500 New Zealand dollars. Now, I asked the woman who purchased this, why, why did you buy it? And she said, because of the story. And I said, the story? She said, the story of Kauri, it moved me. It did something to me. She didn't play guitar. She wanted the story to continue. She wanted this guitar in her boardroom and her dining room table because she felt the story was so strong and so beautiful that she wanted a piece of that story. What does that make Kauri worth? I'll sell you this ukulele. Any takers? Oh, come on. 50 bucks. It has absolutely no story. It's made in China, and it'll probably last a little bit longer than my talk today. <laughs> I'll sell you this ukulele for $5,000. This is made of kauri. The top is new kauri, and the back and sides are made from what we call peacock kauri, which are trees that were damaged in the original felling of the old growth timber. And now they've grown up to 60, 80 year old trees and some of them have died. And that's how you get that grain in the timber. The reason this guitar is worth as much is fine craftsmanship. Yes, it sounds beautiful. But mainly it's a story. This ukulele carries a story. It carries a story of Cody. It carries a story of New Zealand. It carries a story that's inside our hearts. Much more powerful than economics, this story. So David Hutchins one of the world's leading botanists at the time, in 1918, was brought to New Zealand by the New Zealand government, commissioned to come here and tell us a story about our native forests. They wanted a paper done on the native forest. What should we do? What he wrote is, the destruction of the Kauri forest in New Zealand is one of the greatest crimes of the Anglo-Saxon peoples. Now, timber volume is how we measure Kauri. Cubic meterage. I think that's a very sad indication of the future of Kauri. In the 1930s, we decided that we would grow pine. Now pine is a product. Anyone in the world can grow pine, but it was fast growing, easy to sell, and it proved to be a very good product for New Zealand. Now we have 1.8 million hectares of planted forestry in New Zealand. The great majority of that is pine. But being a commodity on the world stage, the pine is worth whatever the world's price is, whatever they offer. It's a price taker. We're forced to take the price they offer. If we had a kauri plantation and kauri for sale, we could be a price maker. We could tell the world what we want for our kauri. We could create a story around our kauri and create a value for our kauri. But we have no plantation kauri. Why is that? I was always led to believe that kauri was slow growing, far too slow to grow in plantation and certainly not economically viable. And maybe even ecologically it wouldn't grow. Well, it will. Kauri can grow in 60 years to a harvestable, mature tree. In fact, in plantation form, a kauri will go 12 times faster than it will in a native natural state. That was a sort of a, a shocking revelation to me. I thought, it's impossible, but it's true. Take oak, for example. Oak is a slow-growing timber. But oak in France is a huge resource. 600 years ago, the French decided that oak was a very powerful, powerful, powerful resource. So they grow oak that we buy and we depend on solely, 100% for our beautiful wines that we sell to the rest of the world. Our fruit, their timber. Now we have no idea if Kauri would make beautiful barrels to make incredible wine because we've never tried. And New Zealand is a land of dreams, but we've never tried. I find that 
Stunning, really. A few years ago, I say a few years ago, it was probably 25, 35 years ago, maybe. <laughs> I was sitting at a dinner table in a fine restaurant, trying to tie up a contract with an international ski company. And they had no idea I was just here for a wild ride. We discussed it, we got to an agreement, and I stood up to shake hands with the CEO, and I smacked my head into the chandelier. And blood poured down my face, my composure disappeared, but the contract didn't. Why? It's because the story went around the ski industry, round and round and round, and followed me everywhere I went. And the story was more powerful than the contract, because the story is everything. The human being is programmed to hear stories, tell stories, and believe stories. And Kauri's story is so powerful that if we tell it, what can the value of Kauri be? Diamonds. 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 Everyone wants a beautiful diamond in their hand. So if I buy you a diamond, and you wear it proudly, and one day someone says to you, that's a fake, you say, no, no, no. Yes, it is. And you find out it's a fake. It changes everything. The diamond is now worth nothing. It was just a story. But now it's a piece of shiny rock. $13 billion worth of diamonds are pulled out every year for sale. That $13 billion turns into $75 billion in retail product because of the story, the story of love and romance, possibly guilt, that we associate with diamonds. <laughs> and that is a viable economic business. It's a masterpiece of marketing. Can we do that with Cody? Of course we can. A Fender Stratocaster guitar is kind of a very standard rock guitar in the industry. A secondhand Strat's about 500 bucks. But Eric Clapton sold his Strat called Blackie in an auction for 950,000 US dollars. It's a serious guitar. Now you can buy a brand new Eric Clapton signature model Stratocaster for about 1,000. So that's $949,000 worth of story. Now what could Cody be worth? This is Karamiya Davis. He's a kaitiaki, a, a caretaker of the land in a forest block called Wangarara in the far north, near Morewa. Now, Kara, when he was a young boy, saw their land clear-cut. All the trees were taken off in his grandfather's time. Dragged out by bullock teams and taken away in the steam engine. Karamiya grew up watching these kauris regrow. Now he's got second-growth kauri in Rimu and Totara and Pururi and Tanikaha growing all over his property. Beautiful 60 to 80 year old trees. Now, Laurie Williams is a luthier. He made that ukulele. He made the guitar that I sold at that conference. And he made this amazing mandolin. Laurie went to see him and he said, Kara, could I take that tree? You've got a permit. Kara said, No. Then Kara held an instrument in his hands and rolled it back and forth and said, I want my trees to sing. If my trees travel the world and tell the story of Kauri, tell the story of our land, it's the strongest environmental statement that Kara could make. He was telling his story, he was sharing his story. This mandolin is made from Kara's wood. This is Wangara Kara. This mandolin is worth 35,000 US dollars. You're welcome to buy it. <laughs> uh, the reason it is, it's a timber, it's a craftsmanship of Laurie Williams, but mainly it's the story. It's the story, it's the heart, it's the power. And we understand that story. And to translate that story, we need plantation kauri. And we can grow plantation kauri. It's possible, it's successful. The timber trade in the world is worth $300 billion. It's a serious amount of money. And not one dollar is kauri dollars, not one. Now my children, I hope my children can grow in a New Zealand that's full of kauri, in the Rimu and Totara beach, why not? We don't want to cut them, so we do nothing. If we planted them, harvested them, we had tree husbandry, we would have native timber everywhere. And we could have an economic benefit from this kauri, because it is possible. It's not a dream. Song of the Kauri is a film that I started seven years ago because of Karamea. I've now released in 26 cinemas in New Zealand and four international film festivals and more to come. I do question and answers at a lot of these screenings. But it's never questions and answers. It's stories about Kauri. People come along and they tell me about their grandfather, their uncle, their, and it's just this, this amazing power of Kauri. And I see that, and I get so frustrated that we're not doing anything with it, either ecologically or economically. And green economics, to me, is about that blend, about saying to protect an ecological thing like a Kauri tree, we can do it economically. It's much more powerful than any other means. Some of the Kauri, taught that to me, and every day I learn more about Kauri. 
after spending seven years on it, I'm sure my family's sick of Cody. <laughs> but every day, it, it, I find how powerful this, this tree is, and I think, well, what could New Zealand be? What could it really be? Now, I've stood in a Cody plantation in the Coromandel. It's over 60 years old, and the brave people who planted it didn't know what would happen. Now it's a mature plantation of harvestable Cody. But of course, now, no one wants to cut it. It's fantastic. So imagine if we could convince the bankers to let us hedge off our plantation. We could have a cowdy plantation, borrow against it, never cut it down. We could have a cowdy plantation, cut 20% of it down a year, it would ever recycle, we'd have more cowdy and an economy based on cowdy. This is my hope, this is my dream, and I hope my children see it. And this is a song of the cowdy. Thank you very much. <laughs>